I think it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce Faranak Mirafta as the keynote speaker of today. She's going to give a talk titled Feminist Lens and the Underworlds of Urban Struggles, Sumut as Everyday Practice of Radical Care and Resistance. Uh, and before I, I turn to you, Faranak, I'll, I'll say that uh, Faranak uh, is an urban scholar of globalization and professor of urban and regional planning at the University of Illinois Champaign. And her, and, and her work is uh, situated at the intersection of sociology, geography, planning, and feminist studies um, using case study and et ethnographic uh, methodologies. Uh, her research concerns social and institutional aspects of urban development and planning that address basic human needs, including housing and urban infrastructure and services that support it. And she's particularly interested in the global and local development processes and contingencies involved in the formation of the city and citizen struggles for dignified livelihoods. Um, I was just remembering that um, before um, studying Faranak as a, a scholar of gender, I, I first saw your work when I was working on, on public-private partnerships. Um, it's, so it's a, a, a breadth of work uh, that uh, Faranak um, inspires us with. So uh, thank you so much. And I, I should say that I, I'm, um, yeah, I would just go uh, to the to the speech, Faranak, because we're always pressed for time. So I'll stop talking and, and, and listen to you. Welcome. Thank you so much. Let me see if I could share my screen first. Okay. Um, does my screen show? Okay, now you are seeing my screen, right? Yeah. Now, now, okay. Okay. Good. Well. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank the organizers. Uh, uh, for inviting me, for organizing this important conversation, but also including me in it. Uh, thank you, Carolina, Priscilla, Noma, Themba, Paula, and all the others involved in this. And also, I want to thank all of uh, participants of the conference and those who are joining us in um, on YouTube. Uh, okay, so I try to um, keep good amount of time for um, conversation afterwards and uh, comments and um, and all that. But um, I want to uh, uh, first acknowledge that I am um, sharing this these insights with you at a critical historical moment that for many of us is feels like um, despair, heavy hearts for the ongoing and continuing genocide in uh, Gaza and heavy heart for uh, civilian lives that um, has been happening in Israel and in Palestine, uh, particularly now the, the, the ethnic cleansing and um, carnage of, of uh, uh, Palestinians in Gaza. As we are, this is a very uh, moment that we feel is there any shared humanity? How could humans do this to each other? Um, we also, I also find it a very hopeful moment. So it's a, it's really a, a dual, a counter uh, point for for me. And I find hope and um, mm, hope in in the transnational solidarity that is emerging all over the world. Uh, including here in the belly of the beast in U.S. by Jewish um, Voices for Peace, as well as inside Israel by uh, um, Jewish sister and brothers who are speaking up and saying never in our name again. So um, those are hope, but what gives me hope, but also I know that for a lot of us, this is a very um uh, dark moment. So um, in this context, my talk has been very much shaped or examples I'm going to sh share with you is shaped by influence of what is happening. And, and I have included um, 
uh, examples from the Middle East as well as elsewhere. So I hope you bear with me. I give you a little bit of overview on uh, what the next half hour would uh, entail. I asked basically the, the question that drives the presentation is how does a feminist lens help us see the underworlds of urban struggles? Uh, and by underworlds of urban struggles, I mean both those processes that shape urban in development and also those uh, uh, processes that shape resistance or the underworld of resistance in urban struggles. I will focus mostly on the second question, um, the, the question of resistance. We know a lot and I don't want to dwell more on the bad news, so to speak. So um, I briefly talk about how um, the, the feminist lens helps us understanding the making of urban development. And then I spend the bulk of the time in terms of resistance to it. So I ask if we use a, a lens, a feminist lens outside the Western gaze um, that sees actually those um, infra politics of resistance, everyday practices of care as forms of resistance, what would we see? And it's million things that we could see. I'm going to focus on four elements of it. Uh, Sumut, a concept that Palestinians have uh, uh, created or, or uh, about steadfastness and perseverance community mothering, where I will share some examples from uh, an example from South Africa. And then I talk about collectivity and belonging with an example from Brazil and moving on. Okay, so with the first question, how does a feminist lens help us see the underworlds of um, urban development? Um, I want to um, hear, as I said, um, I will be brief, but I think it's important to first talk a little bit about what I mean by care, practices of care, and um, what, what is, you know, in the traditional uh, feminist scholarship, it has been referred to as social reproduction. Social reproduction, you know, um, Sydney Katz talked about it as a feminist geographer talked about it as a stuff of life. All of those things that we don't see it, but is happening outside production to make production possible. And actually to take an expanded meaning of it, stuff of life, whatever helps us to make life. So life making activities and practices of care is, is a word that um, po was popularized this term life making by uh, the authors of 99%, Feminism for 99%, Aruza, Patacharya, and uh, Fazer. So I use the term practices of care as those practices that make life happen and is often not seen and made invisible. In particular, in a uh, article that is coming out forthcoming by myself and Efad Hook at Smith College, we try to show how this work of social reproduction, how these life-making activities are made invisible and devalued, but are critical to formation of urban spaces. They are critical to urban development and urbanization. We use four kind of um, uh, modalities of how social reproduction or life-making activities are um, subsidizing capitalism and its urban formation. Here, for the interest in the interest of time, I'm just going to focus on two examples. And in the question and answers, you could come back to it and we can talk more. In informal settlements, favelas, townships, you know, whatever you call them in different global south contexts, we clearly see that that uh, when the, the municipalities, the government, the state focuses its resources on the affluent neighborhoods and affluent populations, the poorer marginalized neighborhoods are really urbanized and they receive basic services based on free, on um, invisible and devalued work of women in, in poor communities. Poor marginalized groups at the center of them is mostly women who carry this work, be it bringing water to your neighborhoods, sweeping and collecting waste, 
or all sorts of other basic services that in, in marginalized communities falls on the shorter uh, shoulders of um, poor people, but mostly racialized, ethnicized, uh, marginalized women in those uh, uh, groups. So that is one way in which um, we will see that the free work of social reproduction is basically coupling and um, the, the project of capitalist urbanization. Another example that maybe to previous conversations about immigration and immigrants is of uh, interest is what uh, we conceptualize as global Bantustans. For South African Bantustans, uh, we, many of you might already be familiar with separation of homelands from which were spaces of social reproduction, raising families, separating Bantustans or homelands from the locations of mining and production and direct extraction of um, uh, surplus for capital. But these uh, separation of production and social reproduction has also been happening between rural and urban areas, as I said, in during uh, uh, under apartheid between homelands and uh, cities. But I, in my Global Heartland book, I uh, show another variation of it, which is across transnational, international, sorry, borders, where immigrants can do backbreaking low paid jobs in the places like US, uh, where employers pay lower wages to them or and they can afford to reproduce their next generation, take care of their children, take care of their elders, because that job is outsourced to communities of origin. So here we see restructuring of social reproduction at a global scale by outsourcing care work for families um, to um, communities of origin for immigrants. So that notion of a restructuring, global restructuring of social reproduction, I can be, we can be talk about it in terms of global ban to stance, is another form that we see, for example, revitalization of rural small towns in the US because and on the back of this process of global Bantustization, where immigrants work in these Midwest rural Rust Belt areas and revitalize it because their families are supporting the work they are doing in um, revitalizing um, rural Midwest towns, for example. So these are two examples. And um, uh, hopefully, if you're interested, ask for the article, we send it to you. It's still under, um, close to being published. Uh, okay, so I'm going to shift to resistance uh, focus of the presentation. And I want to emphasize that Western gaze in defining not only feminism, but also forms of resistance has been quite problematic for the longest time in social science scholarship. Resistance from a Western um, lens has been seen in the how it often works out in the so-called liberal democratic societies, large scale organizing, mass protests in the sense of being, you know, unions or um, other forms of, of uh, larger scale um, events or um, which is considered to be as resistance. So other forms of resistance, what we could see it as everyday practices of resistance um, or infra politics um, uh, uh, of resistance is not captured by that lens. And that is where we bring in a feminist lens that is outside the Western um, gaze. Um, some call it third world feminism has its own contributions. Black feminism and African feminism also have other contributions to this epistemology of being able to see resistance from below, seeing the underworld of, of resistance. And um, um, several uh, concepts are useful in that. I don't want to go into detail of them, but uh, we can talk about it and maybe in the examples I will share, they will show up. Um, concept of invented spaces that I have uh, written a lot about it. It doesn't happen through formal electoral politics, but happens in within informal politics of everyday practices. Rochelle Gutierrez talks about creative insubordination. 
Um, others talk about politics of presence and performance or uh, practices of collective care. I want to emphasize this is very different from um, the neoliberal kind of uh, feminist version of care, which has been focused on individual care. I am worth it, therefore, you know, spending more money and dodging on self-care, which uh, we are talking about moving it to um, beyond that, to to uh, notions of collective care and community care that I will discuss more. Okay, so for the remainder of the time, I'm going to focus on these four. Um, I, there are many that I hope in the chat box you can add other uh, observations you have in your context. But on these four concepts that I want to, or four examples I want to develop here, where we see practices of care and radical care as potent resistance to dehumanizing uh, patriarchal racial capitalism. So if patriarchal racial capitalism seeks to dehumanize people, how is this resistance to dehumanization happening? I wish to share the first example um, I in my observations in uh, what started as a refugee camp in the oldest Palestinian refugee camp in um, 1949, um, they they were uh, Palestinians that were um, following the occupation of uh, Israeli state from the, the, they were, uh, fled to to Beirut and set up Shatila refugee camp. Uh, I haven't been to Gaza, but having been to Shatila, I feel uh, this is the closest in my imaginary of what Gaza um, is like and um, the the heroic. Um, resistance that Palestinians uh, through all these years have demonstrated. The um, idea of sumut, which is steadfastness, um, perseverance, you could see it in, in, in places like um, Shatila and I would say what um, uh, with heavy heart we should say what used to be uh, Gaza and um, it's in a in a space of one square kilometers. There are about thirty thousand people living today in Shatila in in Beirut, and these are the spaces. That these wires you see, some of them are electricity cables, some of them are water tubes that are connecting the units. And it started as a one-story settlement, basically, and now they are buildings up to seven and eight floor, and it has been in a makeshift. As way basically built on top of each other and bringing services to the units. Uh, what for me as a form of resistance practices of care I observed walking through Shatila um, was seeing the spectacular dignity with which families were raised, children. The children that were sent to school, and I couldn't take picture, I wouldn't have dared to do that um, in respect to, to the local people, but the, the uniforms that were sparkling white colors, ironed kids that are groomed beautifully with their hair and, and everything, for me, that was, you know, with lack of resources, lack of water, electricity, trouble of get, accessing all of these, and how you will see these beautifully groomed children relieving this and uh, homes to, to go to school was a sign of, you can take my land, but you cannot take my dignity. Those are practices of care that if we see from below, we see how people, the notion of sumut and a steadfastness that Palestinians are known for is in many, many shapes. And one of it is that you cannot get rid of us. You cannot, you try to dehumanize me, but you won't succeed. I will keep my dignity. And one of the expressions of it is raising your families and dignity by which you hold yourself and your uh, children. I want to add another example to what my observations in Shatila that was absolutely moving and that was uh, 
the um, a, a makeshift um, uh, folkloric museum, um, in, you could call it folklore museum and memories, that it was in, in one of those alleys that um, in previous slide I was showing you, and this is the translation of what the metal door of the room was saying. To each part, there is a story. From each corner, there is a heartbreak. And this was in the left, you could see everyone when they left, when they fled following occupation, um, Palestinians brought objects from their home, memories of their home, and they are gathering it here as, as a folkloric, you know, memorial. But this has important, my colleague Magdalena Nova talks about insurgents, insurgent heritage. These ways in which Palestinians hold on to their um, big sense of belonging, memories of homeland, no matter how small it might seem, it is very important in making that notion of sumut, steadfastness and persistence that they have had. So we, if we are not, you know, we have to see the underworld of how have they resisted 75 years um, occupation that are through these all sorts of um, practices of radical care, I call it. I want to move from, from uh, Palestine to Iran, another um, heroic example of resistance by um, by women and men uh, under the Islamic Republic. So you have two states actually, um, both of which are um, with the excuse of religion, um, violent, uh, ex you know, um, uh, doing violence to their people. One would be on ethnic and national groups, um, Zionist um, is apartheid state of Israel, of, against the nationality or ethnicity. And in Iran, it's the um, fascist, uh, you would, I don't know how to describe it, a uh, fundamentalist Islamist state, also using religion as a way of brutalizing its people. But their focus is on somewhat um, feminists in Iran call it, some of them call it gender apartheid. They wish to um, control, you, they could get rid of women in public spaces or completely control their presence in public spaces, but limit their, their um, existence into domestic realm if they could that. But heroic resistance of Iranian women in 40 something years has been, you cannot get rid of us. They have tried, they have changed system of education, they have harassed them, imprisoned them, killed them, and they have not yet been able to, to um, do, um, domesticize women. And what is very important in what we can learn from practices, everyday practices of resistance in the Iranian case, is that finally they have been able to bring on men on board in solidarity with women. Uh, it's, it's men have now joined, have for long been uh, um, joining women in their woman life freedom uh, struggle because they have understood what feminist scholars we have been trying to say, you know, feminism not only liberates women, also liberates men. Now with their life experience, they have understood that their liberation comes through liberation of their women. The same way that I think our Jewish sisters and brothers inside Israel are understanding that their peace comes through um, peace with in, in Palestine. So um, in, in, in the Iranian case, the Women Life Freedom Movement, we see that the forms of resistance, it varies. And I think I want to emphasize these everyday practices, this underworld, this minute, basically what I call it the work of termites, right? Is it takes different forms for the Iranian context where the Islamic fascism fundamentalism is trying to um, forbids anything that is beautiful, joyful, love, women are not able to sing, etc., etc. Women assert themselves 
in a spaces that their bodies are banned from. For example, in, in one incident, just going to the neighborhoods that are not, ex or, or to the coffee shop and ordering food without a job in areas that they are not supposed to be. They, they assert themselves in those spaces. Men join women in marching, in, in protests, women play music, sing, all of those things that they are forbidden. But most importantly, they kiss in the public which, where love is forbidden itself. So what I want, I'm trying to emphasize is that the forms of resistance of everyday practices that question hegemony of the oppressive power varies based on where you are and what you are challenging. And we should be very attuned and, and sensitive to what we are uh, fighting against. So here we see the tiny cracks that um, if it's looked at from a liberal democratic lens or a Western lens, we would not see these as forms of resistance. I want to also emphasize that this movement we saw is sitting on 40 years of civic organizing in, in neighborhoods. And I have another presentation that um, uh, I'm, I'm actually another paper I'm working with Mahbub Mohada, which we open up those that infrastructure of resistance, the work that these kind of practices are sitting on. Um, but I want to um, emphasize that we should pay attention to those. I want to also share an example from um, my South African and uh, longstanding work with um, housing assembly. And that's the notion of mothering, community mothers. Elaine Rosalo, um, as African anthropologist, South African anthropologist, used the concept of mothering and community mothering as a way of talking about um, marginalized, uh, brutalized communities in Cape Flats and how they take care of um, their, their youth and their, their people, basically, and, and resist being dehumanized. Uh, so in the case of housing assembly in Cape Town, um, we see this through soup kitchens that is not something that um, new. Um, we know all over Global South, feeding, having collective uh, soup kitchens uh, in Peru and et cetera, they be call it, or just communales. They have existed forever. For um, under pandemic, they became known, more popularized in global north situation and called uh, mutual aid. Um, but this is practices that communities and community mothers have been doing for long. Uh, things like feeding um, the, the communal kind of resources. But I want to emphasize one thing here before moving on, and that is why I use the term radical care. I conceptualize radical care as a, you know, care and radical care by making distinction. One thing is taking care of the everyday needs, survival, putting food on the table, putting shelter and roof over your heads, but that is not enough. Capitalism loves, while it is accumulating women and racialized and uh, marginalized people, take care of themselves and their families, right? We, we know that that is a way in which care is basically rolled, enrolled in capitalist accumulation. That's a thought book, and I write about it in that paper, forthcoming paper. But the notion of radical care is when these uh, organizations and movements are able to go beyond the everyday practice of care as form of survival to also challenge those structures that are producing inequality and injustice. Housing Assembly is one of those groups that I have written extensively about that balances these two or, or moves across these two spaces. Yeah, they, they not only um, do the work of community mothering in terms of feeding and survival, but also they do the radical care of of challenging, taking the unfair policies into court and organizing protests and trying to bring about the structural changes for what produces inequalities and injustice. And that is, I think, a very important um, uh, uh, conceptual distinction that I want to emphasize. 
I want to add one more example. Oh, before I go to the next one, I want to also say that this work of community modeling and cleaning up the mess um, after disasters, this was the day after the explosion in Beirut, usually falls on women and um, I, I have and others have written about it as municipal housekeeping that is going back to that notion of how women's invisible free undervalued unvalued devalued work is exploited by capitalist system and its governance system um, strategies Okay, I want to end, uh, um, maybe close to end, <laughs> with this example from uh, Brazil. In, in March of 2023, I had the privilege and honor of being invited um, to um, Curitiba by my colleague, Jose Ricardo, uh, by, uh, Professor Jose Ricardo Faria, and uh, visited uh, uh, several grassroots organizations. Also, I was invited to um, Rio de Janeiro um, and, and hosted by uh, colleagues, uh, uh, Giselle Tanka, uh, Clarissa um, uh, Freitas actually accompanied me together. We were hosted by this organization or movement called a uh, Northwestern Zone uh, uh, Solidarity Web in Rio de Janeiro. It's a network of grassroots groups um, that um, are, are women um, bringing their resources together in resistance to dehumanizing forces of um, patriarchal racial capitalism through asserting their um, ancestral roots, other practices of care and radical care. What I want to share with you is that um, the, uh, the, the key um, uh, organizer of that um, meeting visit that was hosting me, Sylvia Baptista, who is in this image in white t-shirt, she um, organized something called Caravana Internacional de Faranac for two days, going from one of these groups to another to another within the network. I was first very uncomfortable. I felt embarrassed and uh, uh, humbled why, why, you know, making such a um, and call it a caravan international for me, you know. But half a day into the caravan, I realized that she is a, a seasoned organizer, community mobilizer, and she was, it, this was not about hosting me, this was using my presence to further strengthen and organize the or groups within the network. And that is what I want to talk a little bit about, the importance, I mean, these practices of care have many dimensions to be able to do smooth and um, uh, resist dehumanization. One of them is what I want to share through this example, which is belonging, collective identity. What Sylvia and Northwestern Zone of Solidarity was, was doing for that group was to remind everyone of they are part of a collective. Every meeting we went to, she brought up this banner that says uh, Agriecologia um, para todos. Um, the, the banner of the group as a way of identifying you are not alone. Your group is part of this collective. Having the map opened up and showing that there are other groups within the network. And this was key to the activity of going around for those two days to different organizations within the network to reassert and reassure that sense of belonging to a larger collective and a collective identity. This was also seen in Curitiba group that um, um, we visited and where MTST activists were talking about how they nurture hope despite all the awful things that happen to, to oppressed people is that they nurture hope by being, knowing they are part of a collective. This was the conversation was a Ricardo Faria and I had with MS, MTST leaders that were saying, we don't feel despair because we are part of a collective. And it's individualism that brings despair and despair brings violence. So I think that notion of what are the kind of and the work of Terramans, those tiny, tiny works underworld that happens 
to make you feel part of belonging and collectivity as a form of resistance that um, uh, would allow us to, to um, move on and um, more than that to, to um, bring a um, shift uh, which I am hopeful is happening. Where I find my hope is even in this current darkest of the moments is the solidarity that we are seeing emerging. And I think key to these practices of care is also mobilizing local, transnational, cross-sectoral solidarities. That is very important. And we will see that even today in this darkest of the moments, perhaps the only silver lining that exists is the, the battle for minds and hearts. Um, if if um, Zionist apartheid state was trying to win that battle, they have lost it clearly with massive uh, protests that against genocide is happening within um, even US um, as well as all over the world and um, in in um, Israel itself it, it it allows us to see the importance of these solidarities this is referring to a march that was organized by women in in Israel um, uh, women wage for peace uh, Israeli based feminist group as well as women's groups in Palestine and it, it, um, it happened uh, around the, close to the wall of the uh, West Bank. So I think the solidarity message and solidarity practices and rising solidarities are key to, to um, the, 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 our fight against dehumanization and also smooth that um, I think is, is um, you cannot get rid of us, you cannot dehumanize us. Um, it, it is, um, these are key elements. I um, want to just conclude by again uh, summarizing and, uh, what we talked about and um, the, the emphasis on um, a feminist lens that comes from global south. Um, non-Western lens, if you want to call it, and its epistemologists will see this work of Teramite chipping at what we call our collective cause bully urbanism, dismantling the structures of patriarchal racial capitalism and its form of urbanism that we call ur bully urbanism to construct a human urbanism. Uh, with that, I conclude my presentation and I would love to hear more uh, from participants and everyone else. I hope I didn't go over time. I did not actually take a um, look at my watch. So I hope I didn't go too far. I don't thank know. You. Thank you. It, it's perfect timing. Uh, thank you for a, a wonderful presentation. I was really touched. I had goosebumps. So I'll try to keep myself together, but I wanted to thank you for positioning yourself uh, in this presentation and 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 talking talk about the 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 uh, uh, one of the hardest moments that we are uh, living, uh, um, just mesmerized with the dehumanity, how inhumane uh, the the times are that we are living. But but bringing this and 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 to the center of of, of this discussion, talking about uh, this um, carnage in 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 uh, Palestine and and, and 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 saying as it is, and, but also um, I was just again uh, very touched with how you talk about the daily practice, and and I was thinking that. Uh, as a researcher, you bring this careful uh, uh, practices of care in the research as well. Very touched, for example, to see how you spoke of the kids uh, going to school in their in their uniforms, uh, despite a situation of poverty and 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 lack of water. And I could relate that to some of the communities mm -hmm. that I see. And and rather than thinking infrastructure or 
uh, why are our mothers uh, uh, caring about uniforms uh, when there's so much more to worry about? You're bringing this this issue that's so uh, clear, but you it's so obvious after you put it um, that you can take my land, but you cannot take my dignity, and and I'll send my my kids to school, and um, which is also something that uh, reasons to so many so much of the work that we see or what we listen that uh, despite all the difficulties the parents and the mothers will try to get their kids to go to school and to get an education so they can have a life that's better than than what the parents are the mothers are having today thank you Faranaki. i was really inspired i wanted to uh open up uh with this question of um, how do you, uh, I, I, co continuing, um, if you can tell us a little bit more, how do you practice practice uh, this, um, res uh, uh, this research uh, of resistance? Um, uh, in, how, how do you work that um, to uh, research the practices of care and resistance and sumud? Uh, in your daily work, uh, working with your with your partners, working with your students, this is something that we've been discussing uh, a lot here as well. How do you carry on this research that give us so much hope, but it's also a little bit of despair because um, um, you know because of 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 where things are going. Thank you. Uh... Yeah, that question of, you know, if we dwell on, I think I want to say one thing about um, academic, pure academic work. And um, I, I, I'm trying to remember, uh, I'm blanking on the name of the scholar who, geographer, who said um, academics are like coronals, they, they are very well in detecting what was the cause of death, but they cannot um, do anything about the death. So we, um, I think, engage the scholars and try to not only analyze how things are going wrong, how we are being, uh, you know, um, exploited um, and terrible things happening, but after analyzing and understanding the root cause of problem, also take the step of what do we do about it? What do we do about it in our own, you know, uh, communities we live in or um, work that we do or relationships we have? And um, um, it, as, a, as an academic, how do we try to address the problems and not only analyze and explain the problems? Um, so one of the things that... Um, I think I, I want to share here with the group is an initiative that actually um, I'm very glad to be part of this conversation because I see it's organized by scholars based in South Africa, based in Brazil, based in Tanzania, and similar um, collective is being formed by um, ac engaged academics in Brazil. And I mentioned a few of them. Um, uh, the Urban Lab in Rio de Janeiro, um, um, Carlos Weiner, uh, Fabricio. Uh, I, um, I think I'm glad in the chat I see the names are fully uh, included. So I hope people in the YouTube can also see the, the chat here. Um, Giselle Tanaka, Clarissa Freitas, uh, Jose Ricardo Faria. These, this is the group and uh, others in and the, the uh, Brazilian context together with movements that they have been for long building relations of trust and reciprocity. Similarly, we are part of a collective and collaborating with South African-based academics at University of Western Cape, Coney Benson, Greg Reuters, and uh, Ken Solo, who is both at UWC and University of Illinois, and myself have been for long working with the um, grassroots organizations in South Africa. 
So we are hoping through this collectivity of engaged scholars who are not only based in academia explaining the problem, but also doing something about it by building relations across borders of walls of university and communities, co-create knowledge and have that kind of um, working with communities so they are part of this knowledge production. And we are launching a, a project that um, is, is, you know, in very nascent phase of it, of bringing directly the voices of grassroots organizations like the Northwestern Zone of uh, Solidarity Network, and where they can tell their stories and they can be producers of knowledge. And these grassroots movements that are doing the practices of care, doing the smooth, if you want to call it, can learn from each other. So as academics, we become facilitators, but we are not the source of knowledge. The, the knowledge is produced through everyday work of the people who are actually fighting against their dehumanization. So um, how I do it in my academic um, uh, work is by um, uh, trying to work with the you know, um, other colleagues through collectives and with communities to co-create um, knowledge. And I, I think I don't see any other way than uh, this is such a, um, I think the, the viciousness of the system gets worse every minute. So we have to also um, network and unite in order to be able to, to fight back. I hope I responded to your question. Yes, Faranak. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll put some questions because I, I'm afraid we're like we're, the time is going really fast and it's absolutely fascinating. So I'll, I'll I'll say I'll ask a few questions that are uh, on the YouTube and we're bringing them here. Uh, if anyone here in the room would like to raise their hands, uh, but um, I, continuing on, on what you're saying, Faranak, and perhaps I can just emphasize some of the issues that you already mentioned, but one of the questions was um, based on uh, Maria Puig de la Casa or Puig, um, how to, yeah. and that, um, hmm? maybe, maybe you could start with the YouTube, the, the two ones okay. that I put at the end, Luciana and, is, and Rosa uh, Cacchetti. From Luciana Morin? Yes. So Luciana Morin is the one that's saying, thank you for bringing the topic of war. The way that he conceives radical care practice is something broader than everyday care. And um, um, uh, and it evolves the, the dignity of a people, their memory, the resistance of their bodies and non-domesticable Iranian women in an expanded concept that shows care, which we call be careful with and which which we call to be careful with and in the territory. Uh, so then Luciana Morin is asking um, how radical care brings consequences to invited and invented spaces, which is another of your concepts. Mm -hmm. uh, and Faranak, and then another question, sorry, I'll ask you, please, how does Faranak view the idea of peripheral feminism that was addressed in, in many of our panels here if it is possible to add to the invented spaces or, or, or of insurgent planning, this additional political layer of uh, peripheral feminism. <laughs> Thank you. Much. I think, I think uh, um, it's, it's more of a comment than question because I think the answer, the response is within uh, the way that uh, formulation of the question is, is posed. And I absolutely agree that um, radical care is closely connected with the notion of, of invented spaces. So as I have articulated invited and invented spaces, at the, the, you're not um, mutually exclusive, that grassroots movements move from one to the other, right? They, they um, use the, the uh, um, permitted or legitimized the spaces of action, but they don't limit themselves to that. They move to invented the spaces where they can 
uh, create a space uh, for for and demands and make it happen. So similarly in um, radical care, you need to feed your children, feed yourself, have your bodily existence. So you can't do a revolution if you are not existing. You can't be just, you know, I want to, to see revolutionary act, but you have, you need a roof over your head. So it is seeing how the practices of care for keeping body and soul together um, is, in, is necessary, but not enough. From there, you have to move on to being able to, to challenge something that produces your condition. So I think that kind of a relationship that the um, question was posed as the relation between invented spaces and, and a radicality of care, when you push the care to not be just uh, uh, everyday survival, but be something beyond that challenging the uh, structural, achieving structural changes is very much related to uh, works with that concept. So peripheral fe feminism, I think, is it precisely uh, the kind of epistemology, how we know what we know, how where we look for things and how we look for things will give us a different perspective, right? So if we looked from that thousand um, miles bird view at uh, what is happening in Middle East, for example, in Iran, which, you know, place that is close to my heart, I was born and raised there. I know it is often seen as submissive and nothing happens there. People are oppressed. Da, 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 da. It took maybe the Women Life Freedom um, movement to for people to some of them were surprised where did this come from but it was not surprise, surprising for those of us who were living in it right because we were seeing that work that cracks that are happening underneath the structure that suddenly then brings down um, the structure so I think uh, in terms of peripheral feminism uh, that is precisely the um, a way of looking from below. This may be the most uh, general way in which we can put it, that exists for those of us who are in subordinate um, positions, the, the former colonies, that doesn't, I don't mean geographical, but um, you know, the, the oppressed, marginalized people within each of the societies, don't we don't have the luxury of um, being seen from thousand miles above. So we, we have to do our work in ways in which that is often not visible to oppressive um, systems in power. Thank you, Faranak. Fantastic. I wanted to open to um, our audience here for questions, since we've been privileging the YouTube. Paul. I always have questions, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Faranak. Uh, I bring you one of my questions. I'm preparing a, a class for Friday, reading a lot about care. So mm -hmm. it's a talk open it a more, more than I expected about that. And and when I, when I, in one of my readings, Maria Puig de la Casa, uh, uh, she says that we should look for care as in as ethical and political. And she shows how care sometimes is is seen as the opposite of science militarization and and war <laughs> and she asks something that i like because in latin america we always uh, we always say about doing a strike of care let's stop doing care to be noticed uh, as women uh, as 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 a, a reproduction work and she asks but how can we do a strike full of care? Is that possible to transform doing care? 
And what does it mean to opposite care as a political intervention? I would like to hear about that just to change a little bit between us. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Uh, so uh, I, 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 I want to use, first of all, I'm glad that you are teaching something on that and I would love to have the syllabus and, and continue the conversation. And the, the term um, care, which I think is, is uh, you know, the notion of social reproduction was in the Marxist language and used for for longest time, perhaps one of the first people who started talking about social reproduction and the term was Engels and his writings about family, right? But it it has been often limited in understanding its relationship with production. What social reproduction and the work that family does means for production. It started to enter the uh, and the, the analysis of how urban space is relying on this social reproduction work has come to the conversation by feminist geographers later on. Um, if an, a Marxist analysis of urban space, not only production, but space, uh, came in in the 60s and 70s by Castells and Harvey, and et cetera, it was in the 80s that we would say feminist geographers said, okay, so how does social reproduction shape or influence a production of space? And um, I think that has been also mostly from a, a Western uh, feminist geographers talking about that. And uh, the issue of language of care um, and life making, um, which coincides with uh, not uh, with, with um, pandemic, globalized it, in, in a way of, as I said, what was already done in poor neighborhoods of Global South for the longest time suddenly became the current language of mutual aid, et cetera, and um, a concept that was popularized in Global North. But I mentioned it and I want to emphasize the uh, ethical and political um, dimension of it, which is what you started your question or comment by, um, that care should be understood as an uh, ethical and political question. Because if we depoliticize it, then it is exactly what I refer to as a neoliberal feminism, that uh, care is, you know, is an individual self-care is very much used by uh, neoliberal capitalism. Oh, you're worth it as a woman, go pamper yourself to spend million dollar, you know, treating yourself to massage this, whatever. So that is that has been the notion of individual care, individualized care, that uh, in terms of that ethics and politics of it, who is doing the care work for you? The women in the San Francisco and the Hawkshine very much showed that they transferred their burden of care work for their families to Filipino nannies who had to leave their children with their, um, you know, their loved ones with their um, rural um, parents and mothers to, in order to be in San Francisco and care for the affluent um, women uh, who are very, uh, you know, high up on professional hierarchy. So that is the ethics of, of that care work that when we take a global lens, a global transnational feminist lens, we can see it. And the political side of it is precisely, as I said, moving from the individual to the collective care. So I want to resonate with what you mentioned that it's very important to uh, avoid the abuse of the term care uh, and the concept of it, uh, to move from individual to collective and move from the local to a global scale of analysis. Otherwise, it is very easy to fall into the trap of what I call it a neoliberal um, concept of, of care. Uh, I hope I, um, I don't know if I answered, but I hope I addressed to you the, the concern about the, the key uh, to, to notion of uh, care and why I use the term radical care as a way of emphasizing the moving of transscalar um, understanding or lens or perspective on care. Um, 
and, and historical. So again, that goes gets me back to the lens that I use in, in talking about insurgent uh, practices, that you have to have that transgression, historical and transnational, in being able to understand practices of the grassroots, whether they are bringing about a positive social change or actually reinforcing the oppressive um, dominating forces.